Hello, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to everyone joining us for this live virtual session brought to you by People Matters in association with Nolscape. My name is Jerry, and I'm part of the People Matters team here. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this live session today. So we're talking today about uh, building an emotionally intelligent workplace. And uh, this is something we've probably all experienced in our work life, right? You've seen some leaders struggle to cope with emotions and uh, you've seen the impact of that. Uh, it could be le leading to disastrous decisions at work, uh, whether it's people centric or business centric, right? At the same time, there are those leaders who are able to analyze their emotions, they're able to handle it well, and they're able to find a balance uh, between their business priorities, team needs, and people needs. And they're also able to drive their teams to greater standards of conduct and performance. And so today we will be talking to experts uh, on this theme to capture how they are thinking about building an emotionally intelligent workplace and, um, and yeah, we will have some key action tips for you. And we hope this conversation is uh, really useful to you. So with that, I'm gonna quickly introduce our speakers for this panel. We have with us uh, Surya Prakash Mahopatra, who is the Global Head for Talent Transformation and Le Learning and Development at uh, Wipro Digital. And he has over 20 years of experience in various leadership roles, uh, including several IT and ITS organizations. And he's helped set up a global training function for Wipro BPO, which span across 10 countries, um, including Brazil, uh, Mexico, Romania, Poland, China, and India. Uh, welcome, Surya. It's great to have you with us here today. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here. Great. We also have with us Anne Somya, who is the Director for HR at Adeco India. And she's an HR professional with over 20 years of organizational experience in human resources strategy and end-to-end -end HR operations design and implementation management. Um, again, across various industries, including BPO, Capitals, and IT services. And she's currently passionate about designing people's strategy that's in alignment with uh, the driving key business metrics. Great to have you with us, Anne. Thank you, Jerry. And hi, everyone. Very good afternoon. Looking forward to this discussion. Fantastic. We also have with us Rajiv Jairaman, who is the founder CEO of Nolscape. He spearheads the organization strategy and serves on its board. And over the past few years, uh, Rajiv has built a high octane global team at Nolscape that helps organizations accelerate employee development using an integrated learning and assessment platform. And under his leadership, Nordscape has delivered uh, durable business outcomes for over 370 leading organizations across 25 countries. And uh, he has a keen interest in psychology of learning, design, and technology. Most recently, he is the author of the book, Clearing the Digital Blur, which is a definitive guide to helping organizations and leaders transform at the speed of digital. Great to have you with us, Rajiv. Thank you so much, Jerry. Happy to be here. Fantastic. So before we begin this conversation, I would uh, encourage our audience to ask questions. Um, if you have any comments, if you have any thoughts that you would like to share on this topic, uh, feel free to use the chat section that's at the right hand side of your screen. And uh, we have reserved some time at the end of this conversation to take up some audience questions. Uh, so feel free to post your thoughts throughout this session at any time. Right. Okay, so without any further ado, uh, let's jump right into the discussion. So first question really is, uh, is a definition, right? So how would you, each of you, uh, define emotional intelligence uh, at the workplace? Um, can we start with Anne? Sure, sure, Jerry. Um, I, I, you know, um, the way I'd like to look at it, and especially in an adult um, uh, environment where we come into a professional environment to to work, uh, to me, I feel where does emotional intelligence come into play? Often it is when conflict arises, right? And um, we all know that conflict is between one person who may be right, one person who's not right or wrong. But in a professional setting, often, more often than not, the conflict is not between a right and a wrong. The conflict is between your right 
and my right. And uh, emotional intelligence is often uh, comes into play when both of us with your right and my right have to come together and decide what is right for the organization. And that's where I think emotional intelligence is of utmost importance and how I would define it. How does two people who believe that they are right come together and decide which is the best right for my organization? So I think I would define it that way. So what is required is understand my uh, emotions, be able to control it, be able to express and manage interpersonal uh, relationships judiciously, empathetically to reach um, right organizational goals. Fantastic. I, I really like how beautifully you put it uh, between your right and my right, but is it aligned to the organization's right? So uh, that's great. Surya, can we have your thoughts on this? Oh, I completely agree with Anne, uh, what she said. I think she has put it beautifully. Uh, if I have to, uh, you know, define emotional intelligence, or if I have to talk about an organization where emotional intelligence is highly valued, I would say such an organization provides workplace where everyone's ideas are respected and valued. I think that is the first and foremost. An organization where collaboration happens naturally and spontaneously, where decisions are highly valued. I think once you agree what is right for the organization, everybody values it, irrespective of their personal opinion. Uh, an organization where colleagues celebrate each other's success, right? Uh, an organization where stumbling blocks are removed quickly because people come together and they stand up for each other. An organization where integrity is valued. An organization where human potential is continuously developed because it creates a non-threatening environment where human potential can thrive. So I would say um, an organization where emotional in intelligence is va highly valued provides these opportunities. Or this is what we get to see in such an organization. Fantastic. I think you made a list of uh, you know habits and values that's very central to the success of the company. So thank you so much for sharing that, Surya. Rajiv, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, to me, I think for the longest time, business has been very left-brained, right? Profits, Excel spreadsheets, processes, and so on, right? But in the last 10 years, I think there has been, at least in boardrooms, it's okay to talk about happiness, well-being. Uh, what otherwise was brushed aside as touchy-feely things, are becoming important, right? So I think finally we have a space inside an organization to talk about these things that really matter to the human. And the other bigger change that's happening around us is in the industrial age, it was all about one size fits all. Today, the, the larger change that's happening is everything is tilting towards the individual. And when we're talking about individuals, the individuals like Surya rightly pointed out, their values, what matters to them, their feelings, their emotions, all of those things start to count, right? And if we are operating in the workplace with industrial leadership systems and industrial values, then definitely we are out of touch. Right? And that's why I think this topic is uh, very timely. It's time to introduce uh, emotional intelligence and well-being in uh, predominantly left-brained organizations. Fantastic. Thank you, Rajiv, for sharing that. Uh, I think we are also observing it here at People Matters where we're having a lot more conversations around wellness. For example, something that we didn't discuss as much, but today it's more commonplace and we're uh, seeing leaders discuss this more. Um, so great. Um, Surya, the next question is to you. Uh, we're navigating what seems to be like a hybrid workplace for you know the short term at least. Uh, what is the impact of emotional intelligence and streamlining functions and creating the right work culture? Well, I think this is a great question. The impact of emotional intelligence on streamlining functions and creating the right culture in a hybrid workplace. So I think the pandemic has disrupted everything. It has challenged many of our paradigms. We are living in a, in a new normal. I think all of us are familiar with that. That's, that's no longer a, a new world. So um, what is changing? I think a lot of things are changing. Functions, practices, processes, and organizations are changing. Uh, let me quote Daniel Goldman. He said something very interesting. He said, 
out of control emotion makes smart people look stupid so somebody might be highly intelligent but if he cannot if he or she cannot control his or her emotions he would definitely he or she would look stupid organizations today have realized that they cannot afford to hire stupid people they may not hire smart people in some cases but they cannot afford to hire stupid people so the first impact that we see today is on in selection recruitment and that's what we are seeing today now uh, emotional intelligence is one of the key competencies what organizations are looking at while recruiting engineers recruiting project managers recruiting talent into their organization so it it has become an important criteria for selection uh, it is being looked at for progression to leadership roles so um while it is important uh, that a leader must have strategic perspective must have the execution must have clear line of sight on the organization's vision somebody who can bring in a uh, creator and uh, and communicate a strategy and vision while all that is important um emotional in in intelligence today tops the chart so while selecting um people into leadership roles now this is being looked at it is a key consideration for selection progression to leadership roles um the lnd function is definitely uh, you know is 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 seeing an influence i think uh, from an organizational perspective i am an lnd leader myself and in the last couple of years um given what is happening around us given the way pandemic is impacting organization the way today everybody is vulnerable we see um um that we need to develop our leaders we need to enable our leaders to become um more intelligent in terms of eqs you know they need to develop their eq they need to improve on their emotional intelligence so programs like non violent communication nurturing talent and whole lot of other programs which have taken which have actually taken center stage mentoring and coaching we believe is our key enablers when it comes to emotional intelligence when when people are struggling in in a hybrid workplace in a very stressful environment and when today we talk about you know the great global resignations you know um in in an environment which is stressful when business is growing but demands of customers are kind of evolving and you are losing your key talent and and then you have pressures at home in an environment like this i think um it is important that we need to support our people so coaching and mentoring play a very important role the rr the reward and recognition practice you know those processes are definitely uh, while the focus in the past were rewarding the top performer the guy who brought in the highest uh, revenue to the company or somebody who you know who kind of excel in 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 a uh, sales or in in meeting a uh, key uh cpms for the business while they continue to remain important for organizations but now um in a reward and recognition practice now organizations looking at can we reward people who are collaborators who are helping others succeed who are excelling in teamwork etc so these are some of the changes that we are seeing i would possibly uh, look at them as impact of emotional intelligence on functions and the way organizations are looking at streamlining their practices and building a culture of very strong uh, emotional intelligence fantastic i think surya you've given a very good overview of uh, the different aspects of the employee life cycle right that this touches on right from hiring to lnd to leadership to even rewards over how it's sort of changing uh the conversation across every probably touch point that uh hr has uh in the organizations so thank you so much for that uh sharing that so i am i'm coming to you now on the significance of uh, emotional intelligence what is its impact in creating an empathetic work culture and could you also share uh, a deco's own experience on this absolutely jerry see i um, i i really uh, think whatever surya has uh, listed out you know those are really great uh, pointers to see whether emotion how emotional intelligence is becoming important at the workplace now for us um, uh, we the pandemic has really turned our ways 
that we work, uh, that each of us knew work and work life as we knew it upside down. So uh, in the new normal, what is becoming even more difficult for organizations to protect and cascade is the organizational culture. Right. So I think, uh, you know, I was recently reading in a, uh, an article, um, uh, you know, in Narayana Murthy himself stating that he's not a great advocate of um, uh, working remotely because he feels that uh, it could dilute the culture of the organization. So I feel emotional intelligence has a crucial role to play here in making sure that the organizational citizenship behavior is preserved. When teams are made up of people who are aware of their own behaviors, their own preferences of how they would like to work in even a remote scenario, um, Many times uh, we say that, you know, uh, we are we are all communicating through video calls or um, uh, virtual meetings. We may be saying yes, but we may have a no written all over us, right? Which in a face to face environment is easy to read. Communication barriers are much more simpler to crack when you are sitting across the table and you know who you're discussing with. Uh, at this point of time, we don't have that liberty. Many times we have to understand uh, people from the tone of their voice, maybe um, uh, from uh, a yes that may intend a no, so on and so forth. This is where I think emotional intelligence comes to play, where each of the teams interacting with each other, if they are open, first of all, if they themselves understand their emotions, if they know how they can maneuver and master their emotions, express freely, and also um, work collaboratively with each other. So we all know the Johari window, right? So we know that teams which has the minimum um, uh, blind spots or blind spaces are the ones that have most effective ability to perform together and deliver together. So emotional intelligence is very crucial at this point for each of us working in this hybrid um, or virtual environments to even more master our own selves and the people who we work with. And this in turn, an organization that takes effort to help people understand and maneuver through this virtual bar communication barriers will obviously have an edge at how they preserve their organizational citizenship behavior and finally the outcome of culture of the organization. And what better way to uh, emphasize the importance than Peter Ducker himself who said um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So um, with all this coming into play, I think in this world that we are in currently, emotional intelligence at workplaces needs to be given a serious spot in every organization's agenda. Absolutely. I think uh, said it again very beautifully. I think uh, this concept of organizational citizenship behavior that you spoke about and also possible challenges that uh, companies need to be mindful of. Um, great. So, Rajiv, the question to you is on the urgency and need for uh, emotional intelligence. I heard when Anne was talking also, she highlighted the challenges with the remote context, right? And that's sort of also a blind spot, if you will. Um, so how do you value, how can this value be measured and should we even try to measure emotional intelligence? Yeah, I think we should. Uh, because as the popular saying goes, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? Uh, but the question is, what do you measure and how do you do this scientifically? Because there are a lot of measurements we already do, employee engagement and satisfaction scores and all of that. So what is unique about what we are trying to measure here is the question. Now, I think that uh, calls for a deeper understanding of why this is happening in the first place and what are the dif different dimensions of this. Now, uh, if you just break this down, I think you will find, of course, there are multiple factors that are going on at the same time, uh, triggered by the pandemic and other factors. But really, if you um, apply it in the workplace, number one, from a productivity lens, uh, Satya Nadala, I think, uh, is believed to have said, you know, decades worth of work seems to have gotten done in a few decades, uh, in a few quarters, right? We seem to have 
accomplished a lot in a very very short time and in a context when this great resignation is going on which means that people who are left behind are saddled with more work uh, to be done uh, right and so that obviously is causing a lot of um, issues physical mental for um, uh, for the uh, you know for the workforce so i think there has to be a study done on the productivity levels of what this whole situation has done to the amount of work we are getting done when um, this whole line between work and life has been blurred right and uh, so what is the impact of that i think that's a big area of study uh second is um i think from a, a mental health perspective the number one reason why i think many issues come is because of the general sense of loss of control we have on what's happening in our lives right and that's the number one reason why mental health issues happen now in this context um given the geopolitical issues uh, a health care scare happening in hong kong the very next day on social media reaches us and we are scared about what when it might reach our doors um and uh, you know loss of loved ones and all of these factors put together makes us all feel that we are watching television and someone else is holding the remote control or we are running on the treadmill and someone else is holding the the speed dial right and so there is a general loss of control that we are uh, facing which is directly leading to this uh, heightened sense of anxiety and hence mental health uh, health issues and so on so we need to study that aspect uh, also in the workplace and um, we know this from uh, our life on the digital world right on the digital side of things let's say uh, take social media there is a direct correlation between uh, the use of social media and mental health issues it's been scientifically researched and proven and so on uh, to an extent that today did you know that uh, some countries have a minister for loneliness uk has a minister for loneliness and so does japan and uh, so why are we here when uh, social media is supposed to be connecting all of us why are we feeling lonely if this can happen on social media the same thing can happen within the organization we may all feel that okay i'm connected on slack i'm connected on uh, uh, salesforce or wh whatever the platform may be but the reality is uh, the digital connection that we are talking about does not translate into human connection Uh, right and that's what that's why we need this minister for loneliness in many countries so uh, it is ironic uh, when social media and digital is connecting us uh, we we feel uh, we still feel this way so i think all this put together i think uh, really deserves a, a detailed study and a measurement technique that can help us manage this better fantastic uh, i really like about uh, everything that you've covered in terms of the factors that we need to pay attention for i think uh, right from the heightened sense of anxiety to the general sense of lack of control and even social media and how it's impacting our mental health so rajiv what would you suggest uh, in terms of key metrics that organizations can sort of zero in uh, on emotional intelligence currently sure so i think uh, we do need a holistic uh, way of measuring this and and tracking this um and so i do believe that this has to have multiple dimensions to it including physical wellness obviously if we are all burnt out uh, because of the long hours we are putting in uh, that will lead to emotional issues these are interconnected things right so uh, physical wellness uh, mental wellness obviously right how how are we doing um, uh, emotionally that is very important and um, in many industries there has been an impact on livelihood uh, right it's been a lives versus livelihood uh, kind of a, a trade off we've unfortunately been uh, forced to make so there are financial uh, wellness issues that are cropping up uh, and social wellness issues as well and you could add spiritual wellness and other elements as well so i think we need a holistic uh, way of measuring what is actually going on fantastic i i really like uh, that we covered this holistic dimension i think we always kept hearing about this five dimensions uh, throughout this two years i think of wellness and how do you address this holistically that's great uh, thank you for sharing that rajiv so in light of these metrics that uh, rajiv has shared uh, surya and i'm coming to you on what are some challenges that you're observing uh, in terms of measuring and evaluating people on uh, emotional intelligence So Jerry personally I'm not a big fan of uh, measuring emotional intelligence um you know 
if attrition happening in your organization, you don't have to go and check, you know, what is, you know, you really don't have to check whether the emotional intelligence is high or low. You know, it's just, just a fallout of uh, what's happening, you know, whether it's the behavior of leaders, the way uh, the organization is treating its people. So there are many symptoms that we can see and understand, you know, what's happening. Uh, I don't think we really always need to, you know, use a tool to measure emotional, you know, intelligence of people. The bigger question is, once we measure it, what are we going to do with this? You know, that's the bigger question. And I think we need to get a handle on that. Uh, today, I think the primary challenge, one of the challenges uh, is, uh, is attrition. The organizations are in a flux. People are coming in, people are going out. So it's, uh, and then there are organizations today, especially in the IT segment, <clears throat> many organizations, 70% of people of the workforce have not been to their workplace, not even once. They joined the organization uh, remotely. They've started working remotely and they're working remotely, right? So there is no connect, face-to-face uh, -face connect. And that's probably why I think Anne was talking about Narayan Murthy uh advocating people can coming back to office so that's definitely a challenge uh great uh, resignations are definitely a challenge you know when people are in a flux and you really don't know i think it sector especially is, is suffering from 30 to 40 percent attrition some organizations even have a bigger attrition percentage and when you are when when almost your entire workforce is getting replaced by new people you know how are you going to measure emotional intelligence? Because you don't have a stable workforce which has been there with you uh, for a longer period of time. So these are uh, some of the challenges that probably organizations see today. Uh, I think more than looking at a tool, assessment tool to measure, I know there are scientifically designed tools available today. But more than that, I think we should really figure out what are the symptoms, what are we seeing in the organization in terms of people experience, and then what we need to do about it. Thanks. And uh, Jerry, I would add, I would add just a, a one more aspect to it. See, uh, when we talk about um, measuring emotional intelligence, uh, if if um, you know, the, there are great metrics that were mentioned about measuring wellness, holistic wellness. Um, the retention, the satisfaction of employees, etc. But yes, these are great ways to measure um, this particular metric. But um, I think we should go one step further. Organizations should go one step further and also look at what is the ROI? What is the return on investment for all of this? So um, is it that we just say that, yes, uh, as a metric, hey, we have uh, very engaged employees. Um, we have uh, people who are uh, emotionally very well right now, but that should also cascade to certain other positive results if you have that, right? It should show in maybe things like change adoption, in, it should show in, um, in, in the uh, business performance, it should show in the productivity, and ultimately it should also show in how your customers are feeling about the services your employees and you as an organization are able to produce so uh, while wellness is a great measure for us to start with i think we should also not um, stop there but also show what are the outcomes of achieving uh, a great um, wellness or an emotional uh, intelligence score for the organization too great great i think great points there by both of you uh, look for symptoms look for outcomes um, and, and don't just focus on the dimensions, right? Um, so, Rajiv, I'm coming to you with this question on challenges, right? That's just been outlined. And we've seen these uh, challenges being faced by multiple companies across domains. What are your thoughts on sustaining emotional intelligence and then also scaling it up uh, across the organizations? Yeah, so um, it's interesting how uh, the questions uh, that, that we are uh, posing the panelists here, right? If, if you notice, we're talking about ROI, we're talking about measurement. Again, going back to what I was saying earlier, it's left brain, uh, right? And so while that is needed, uh, right, what is the right brain solution for it in a way that it is holistic, right? So to your question on uh, uh, sustaining emotional intelligence, to me, any level of sustain sustenance in any domain of life is a question of creating the right habits, 
uh, right? If the habits are in place, uh, things can be sustained. And how do you build these habits in an organization is a question of culture building. Now, it, it boils down to that literally where uh, do we have enough role modeling uh, from senior leaders, right? Where is it just uh, a tick in the box saying, okay, I've done this survey, I've done a few uh, workshops uh, for leaders, or are leaders truly demonstrating the values of empathy and emotional intelligence themselves, right? And and um, I take a leaf out of, um, uh, again, Sathya Nadala's book, uh, Hit Refresh, where he talks about an organization back then, which was seen as evil, uh, right? Microsoft back, back in the day, uh, a dominant force in the industry back then, how they had a know-it-all culture, how they had to become humble and become a learn-it-all culture. That was a cultural transformation that he personally spearheaded. Uh, right, So there is a lot of role modeling that is needed to bring in that empathy in the workplace. Um, and I think at a team level, psychological safety is very important. Um, are leaders actually promoting uh, that sense of uh, psychological safety for people to voice their opinions, feel included, feel a sense of belonging? And is vulnerability OK? And especially during this time where we are facing personal issues, professional issues, uh, mental health issues, all kinds of issues. Are we able to open up in the workplace and talk about these things uh, without being branded as somebody who is not professional? Uh, right. So I think that's an important one and very important to have support systems, uh, mentoring and coaching like Surya pointed out earlier. Uh, do we have support systems within uh, the organization to make it work? And um, and yes, learning programs obviously play a big role to sensitize people towards this issue, which otherwise never gets spoken about uh, openly, right? So I think it's a combination of all of these things that will really uh, ensure sustainability of these efforts within the organization. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I really like how Raju is pushing us to think about the right brain often in this conversation and uh, not just think of uh, metrics and numbers uh, as it were. So thank you so much for sharing that, Rajiv. Uh, Surya and I'm coming to you again on the question of scaling up right now. So uh, how can leaders play an important role here? Because I think, Surya, you've highlighted uh, the mentoring and coaching aspect. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that on how leaders play a very important role in uh, building emotional intelligence and reinforcing these habits that we want to see across the organization? Well, leaders play the most important role because they're in a position to influence others. They can motivate others. They can lead by example. And Raji was talking about role modeling. They can become role models. I mean, uh, who else can, uh, who else is in a better position than a leader to uh, influence uh, people and then kind of bring in a culture of emotional intelligence. Just because the fact that they are leaders, they definitely have the influence, the, the, the probably their capability, not necessarily always, but they are expected to have the capability. They are, in a, they, they are the ones who can motivate others, inspire others, and so on. Now, the question is, leaders are also human beings, like anybody else in the organization. So that's the point. Um, so then as the very common announcement that we all refer to uh, while flying, you know, put on your oxygen mask first before helping others. So leaders also need help. In the last couple of years, when I have been talking to my peers in the industry and many leaders in the industry, many of them have confided in me, and I'm sure you would agree with me, that a lot of leaders have 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 reached this stage where they have felt why am i doing this why i'm doing this you know is it worth doing should i continue in this role because leaders themselves are struggling today under tremendous pressure pressure for growth pressure for retaining people uh, meeting your um, you know objectives driving the strategy and um, and in the midst of, midst of conflicting priorities, finding the right balance. So I think the starting point for the leader is the leader himself or herself. So it begins with self-awareness. A leader, a smart leader who is not self-aware can be extremely destructive. Because if I'm not aware of my emotions, if I if if I you know I have out of control emotions I I kind of flare up I yell at people I may be extremely smart I may 
be driving numbers for the business. I might be reading balance sheets like nobody else. I can set up, uh, you know, I can expand the business into multiple geographies. But if, if I'm not self-aware, if I'm not aware of my emotions, and if I don't know how to act on my emotions in the inappropriate way, I can be damaging for an organization. I think the beginning is self-awareness. That's where it all begins. Then once one is self-aware, once the leader finds the balance, then he or she can help the larger organization find that balance. Now, I think a Western philosopher said something very powerful. He said, what we take from, from this world gives us our livelihood. What we give this world gives us our life. So what we take from this world gives us our livelihood. What we give this world gives us our life. All our life we are taking from this world. We are running after livelihood. But the inner being, the being inside us is craving for life. I mean, if you, if you, uh, you, know, you know, peep into an individual, you will find that that person is hankering for life. And that's what leaders must value and enable the organization to kind of you know, find that. So um, that's why what is important for a leader is to find the purpose. So I think at the core of MS, emotional intelligence um, or core of uh, at the foundation of an organization which has got a culture of very strong emotional intelligence is a sense of purpose. The purpose of creating value for your customers, for the society, for the world at large. If that is missing in an organization, we cannot expect to have strong emotional intelligence because then the organization is running after profits, maximizing revenues, etc. They are important for an organization. But if that becomes the primary purpose of an organization, and if that becomes the primary purpose of a leader, then emotional intelligence will be far away because the leader will then run after profits, um, maximizing revenue, etc. at all cost. At any cost, his or her focus would be to achieve that. I think when the organizations are purpose driven, leaders are purpose driven. And when a leader is able to define that purpose for the organization and help teams functions, groups within the organ organizations find that purpose and help teams and functions and groups align their function with the larger function of the organization and, and help every leader in the organization help the team members align their individual purpose with the larger purpose of the organization. Then it becomes about giving. It's about making a difference, making an impact. That will drive a culture of collaboration, putting self before my own interest. That's where understanding self and understanding others will become, you know, the primary focus. I think that's where I believe a leader plays a very important role. Thank you, sir. Great. And, and do you want to weigh in on this question on leadership and scale? Yes, uh, thanks, Jerry. I think your question was had two parts of it. One is what is the role of leadership and how do you um, implement uh, something like a concept of emotional intelligence at scale in organizations? So I think the role of leadership, both Rajiv and Surya beautifully put it, um, you know, it, there needs to be role models. And if there is um, a, a, a anyone who's responsible for driving um, such uh, organizational philosophies, it has to be at uh, from the top. What I'd like to focus on probably is the second part of the uh, question that you had asked around how do we implement such strategy? If emotional intelligence as a, um, as a metric of importance has to be looked at, how do we drive it? So there is this interesting methodology uh, for organizational design and strategy implementation. It's called the STAR model. So it starts with saying, you know, you first form the strategy. What is it that you want to implement? Uh, you clarify it with clear structure, 
you have people who are responsible for looking into this so it is not just something that comes up hangs very nicely on your boardroom walls and then everybody forgets about it but there needs to be people who are responsible who are going to look at driving this through the year um, uh, the next one is you have processes that are defined that will uh, di you know tell you how you're going to measure it what are the initiatives that you're going to take what is the frequency at which uh, these communications or uh, initiatives will be uh, driven and finally also have a clear cut rewards mechanism that that identifies and reward need not always be monetary it could it could be recognition for behaviors that are that are um, uh, that are uh, expressed which are in line with the strategy that you have discussed so unless you have this clear cut framework of communicating a strategy uh, putting in a structure putting in people then processes and rewards often these could become really good uh, points that you talk about and are framed on a wall somewhere but never really uh, translated into the grassroots levels of the organization great great i think there's some great thoughts there uh Anne and surya i think both of you have covered both the uh logic and the uh action steps as well so thank you so much for that Rajiv, I'm coming back to you on this same line of thought. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot on strategies to sustain and scale, uh, but we're seeing that this context rapidly change with work, right? And um, how can you, how do you think leaders can accelerate the scale of emotional intelligence and uh, create this resilient workforce in spite of this change? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, so we often think in terms of uh, scale, but to me, uh, it all starts with one, uh, right? The self, uh, beautifully put uh, by both Anne and Surya. So it starts with the self. Uh, and around that self, the leader, there is an ecosystem. Let's say a, a leader has 10 people. And the transformation happens with those 10 people. And then these 10 people interface with 10 more. And I think that's how change begins. So in other words, uh, be, the change, be the change that you wish to see in the world, uh, right? If you want... A kinder workplace, I think we need to start from ourselves, right? I think that's uh, essentially the starting point. But the question is, how do we accelerate this, right? How do we make sure that um, if you're dealing with an organization that's 100,000 people strong, 200,000 people strong, how does it reach the entire organization? And uh, for this, obviously, there are, um, you know, capability building programs that can be thought of at various levels, uh, right? So uh, interventions that include um, uh, you know, case studies, stories of how uh, this value got demonstrated. Um, some experience sessions can be done, uh, but more importantly, conversations around this particular topic is what's really going to unlock value, um, where uh, people take an issue at hand and they have a discussion around it. And, it. and I believe that community building around this issue is what's going to make it, I think, accessible to people. It builds a common vocabulary where people understand issues the same way. And they have sort of a, a good response uh, to that issue at hand. So I think these are uh, some responses that I can think of for scaling it up. It begins with one, and then it's a lot of ecosystem building after that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rajiv. Uh, we also have a bunch of questions popping in from the audience, and I'm conscious of time. so. Uh, one last question to all of our panelists here today. What is um, maybe your one key takeaway that you would like to share to our audience today? Can we start with Surya? Well, personally, I think I have learned a lot of things from my two co-panelists. And my takeaway is um, we are living through very challenging times, yet they are the most exciting times. All we need to do is find the balance. And I really liked what really impressed me a lot when Anne said something which was very powerful. You know, it's not about the the conflict is not between the right or wrong, it's about but about my right and your right. For me personally, that's the, the biggest takeaway. And uh, I, I think I look at it about all about finding the balance. Balance between conflicting views, between life and livelihood, profits and purpose, profits and people, health and you know, uh, work and life. I think if we find that balance, I think we we would we would figure it out how to sell through. 
that's my biggest takeaway. Great, Anne, and then Rajiv. Yeah, Jerry, I think uh, for me, um, what evolved as uh, along with the discussions here. Uh, is the thought of we've always known emotional intelligence is very important. We've talked about it. It's not a new uh, concept that emerged now. It has probably taken center stage um, after uh, diversity, which went uh, probably last decade, and then it was wellness, and now work-life harmony, and now emotional intelligence seems to be the uh, one on the spotlight. But like with all the matrices and uh, interests that organizations have picked up um, along the way as we mature, is uh, how do we measure this? How do we uh, make this more relatable as a concept, as a fancy uh, term? It sounds very good, but uh, how do we make this more relatable to our organizations? How do we show the return? And uh, I think there were some fantastic thoughts that Rajiv, Surya had shared on how we should measure these and how we should um, actually assess the impact um, sometimes we can do things as a check in the box, like Surya mentioned, but the trick is to also make sure that is it really benefiting um, uh, the organizations that we work for or the societies that we live in. So uh, that's my biggest takeaway of making this very relevant to our organizations and our society and our people. Great. Rajiv? Yeah, I'm just grateful that I'm part of uh, this panel listening to uh, both uh, Surya and, and wonderfully articulated points um, that will stay with me for some time. Um, what Surya mentioned about purpose and the way he broke it down from a functional standpoint, uh, from assessments to uh, promotions to every stage within even rewards and recognition, how do you bake this in so that it becomes part of the system and it's not one more add-on or a tick in the box? So I really uh, liked that thought process. And with Anne, obviously, a lot of uh, rigor I can see from uh, right metrics, ROI, and beautifully integrated with the overall story of uh, um, the organizational purpose as well. Um, one thing I would lo love to share with uh, the audience here is something that I often think about. I do a lot of work in the digital transformation space. And we all know the capabilities that AI uh, is gaining over a period of time. We are losing to AI in the game of uh, chess and you know, self-driving cars probably can drive cars better than most humans now. So the one thing I often think about is as AI becomes more and more human, will humans become more and more human? <clears throat> That's what I often keep wondering about. So uh, maybe that's this time in history where we have to make that choice. As we think about automation and a lot of other things, um, can we instill human values in our workplace? Fantastic. I think that's a, yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, I feel like we can just live with that thought for a minute. Uh, but we have some questions uh, pouring in from the audience. So I'm going to quickly take them. Okay, so one question on from Lavina on uh, the concept of organizational citizenship, and if you could uh, talk for a minute about this, yeah. Sure. Uh, so I, I I don't know what exactly the question is, but if you're asking what is organizational citizenship behavior, I think uh, this was a concept uh, that came in uh, first by um, someone uh, named Daniel Ogin. Uh, what he describes it as, he puts it very beautifully, I will try to remember the, the sequence in which he puts it. It says it is the individual behavior that is discretionary for an individual. It is not explicitly written or um, uh, you know, mandated by an organization or recognized by a reward system, but it promotes effective functioning of an organization. So it is that um, sometimes, you know, simplified, it is that um, concept that you sometimes walk in and you say that there is something about the air about this place. 
uh, it's that invisible thread that holds organizations together and uh, it's often um, based rooted on very intangible concepts or intangible um, shared feelings like empathy collaboration etc so uh, if you can read up about it uh, is it lavina yes yeah, Lavina, you can uh, just search about it. Um, you can read about it, but there's quite a lot of material on organizational citizenship behavior and how you can promote that within your organization. Yeah. Okay, so there's a question on uh, the responsibility of um, HR alone. So I'm just going to like tweak this a little bit. Is it the responsibility of HR alone to promote emotionally intelligent workplace? Shouldn't top level executives and managers um, uh, also take part in this? I think we've addressed the managers and leaders part uh, to a good extent. But if I could sort of tweak this question and ask maybe Rajiv, what is the role of HR uh, in promoting uh, emotionally intelligent workplace? Yeah, I think Surya has already answered this question beautifully. So I don't think I can do any more justice to that question. But really, uh, breaking it uh, this down to um, every step in the employee's life cycle, from the outreach that we do, the branding that we do, to how um, uh, welcome we make them feel on day one, to uh, fairness in the whole um, career uh, progression path, the kind of opportunities we provide them. Right, and, and he rightly mentioned our successes celebrated, are the right decisions being made, uh, are people operating with integrity. So all of those things, in a way, uh, in an organization, the HR is the custodian for many of these things. Obviously, this capability has to be with everybody, uh, but HR obviously plays a, a big role in ensuring that this culture sticks. Right, and um, I would love to just paraphrase what uh, Surya already has uh, so beautifully answered. Fantastic. Uh, so there's a question from Sanjeevan and uh, he asks, in a manufacturing scenario where we deal with a large blue collar uh, shop floor workers, how can uh, emotional intelligence be used for cultural change, productivity and creating a healthy atmosphere? Surya, do you want to take this? I may not be able to do justice because I don't belong to that industry. Right. Okay. I, I don't like Rajiv. So all right. Okay. So it's an open question then for everyone. Rajiv, yeah, so, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't belong to the industry either, but I'll take a shot at this uh, because certain human values are applicable across the board. Um, so I'll go back to what I started with, right? The right brain, left brain um, sort of either or exists. And um, the, the fact that we need to have an and in between, it's not work or life, it's work and life. Uh, it is not profit or purpose, it's profit and purpose. So that integration mechanism needs to work well, uh, right? In whatever scenario we, we operate in. So similarly in the shop floor uh, where it possibly is all about productivity of the employee, can we also bring in that purpose element, their well-being element and have an and in that equation that makes it favorable for the worker as well uh, right so it's been one-sided for the longest time i think in the industrial world it was all about the factory the production the mechanisms the processes and so there was no uh, voice of the human there and today we are talking about human-centric design right uh, design thinking and other things and i think in many manufacturing setups you you're starting to see human-centric uh, design and one uh, example that i often uh, like to talk about is um, the mri uh, devices uh, right that you find in hospitals uh, right there is this um, experiment they did with uh, unfortunately you know kids that are having to go through that claustrophobic experience it's not too great for them as an experience right um, so they are terrified of that and so they did some design thinking to this whole environment and they created a theme park out of that entire thing so there is actually a, a small cart that takes a child into that tunnel right and that's how the experience is redesigned Right. Obviously, you can see the thrill of that little kid who was terrified earlier, wants to do it now. Uh, right. So can we apply uh, design thinking in our workplace, putting the human right in the center? That itself brings in empathy, that brings in uh, the human needs uh, as an important factor in, in our workplace. 
Okay. Rajiv, uh, thanks for that answer. Rajiv, um, uh, really uh, agree with you on uh, how the design thinking can change um, the experience at the workplace. I'd also like to make a point here. Uh, Surya mentioned before about purpose, right? Uh, recently in a Deloitte uh, or a McKinsey survey last year, um, it said uh, that 70%, and this was a cross-section of all industries and uh, not specific to any sector, um, it said that 70 percent of uh, the workforce uh, currently in uh, at work uh, said that they expect their purpose to come from their work. Right. Could possibly be because we, we as uh, right now, we don't pretty much belong to a nine to five work culture at all. Um, but shockingly, only 15 percent said that they get that purpose from their work. Now, I don't really think that the want for purpose uh, is restricted um, uh, to any particular industry and any particular color of job, you know, white, blue, gray at all. I think as human beings, this is one thing that will cut across every, um, uh, every strata of um, uh, society. And uh, maybe the way you communicate purpose may change, the language may change, the uh, sophistication or the articulation of it may change to make it more relatable and understandable. But I think everywhere workers are looking for purpose um, at their workplace. So when you try to build emotionally intelligent uh, workplaces at differing industries, you've got to assess what is the sense of purpose that your workforce needs and then um, build that in. So I, I really don't think that um, anyone at a, um, a production environment or a manufacturing or a retail or a healthcare sector will have a different need. I think this is a mass loss need that has been cut, that, that will be there for all human beings. We all search for purpose. So I think this, if we are able to uh, think through um, who is your workforce and what is a is the purpose that they are searching for and how can you align it with the, uh, the purpose that the organization can provide to them, you have your answer. Fantastic. That's beautifully put, and thank you so much for yes. that. Absolutely. Um, so, all right. So there's another question on uh, from Habibu Rahman who wants to know, is it not high time for... Uh, to develop tests, I think, uh, both at the government level and probably also the company level to focus on emotional intelligence as uh, as a major attribute uh, that candidates should have. Uh, does anyone want to weigh in on this question of I test? Can, yeah, go on. Yeah. I can make an attempt. I think Habibo uh, has, uh, is a great recommendation. I would go one step further. While we can definitely focus on emotional intelligence as a major attribute for candidates uh, aspiring um, for jobs, etc. But can we go one step further and introduce that in schools and colleges? Because when you're looking at candidates, it's already late. You know, they've already spent 20 years. Can we do it even before that? And then use it more as a developmental assessment, not a selection criteria, right? You know, you know, let's not rate candidates as uh, on a scale of one to five as a three or a four or two, and then say somebody's good or bad. But let's probably introduce that in schools or maybe colleges and find out people actually who are getting ready. You know, those are the places where they're getting groomed for future profession or employment. And, and those assessment findings can be used as developmental tools. They can be used to actually bring in uh, intervention which will help students, young minds in the country develop emotional intelligence and be better prepared for the workplace whenever they get an opportunity. That's my perspective. Great. Fantastic. Thank you, Surya. Um, so we're out of time, but I just have one question more from the audience. I want to make sure that uh, we answer this. Sayana wants to know, uh, from a startup context that is growing at a fast pace, what is the first step that uh, they should take to incorporate emotional intelligence? 
I can take that um, if that's okay. So, uh, Sayana, I think uh, I briefly touched upon this when we were talking about how to implement uh, this at a large scale, which is about the STAR methodology of uh, implementing any strategy. So, first and foremost, look at in your uh, workplace agenda, is, this, um, is the need for emotional intelligence already clearly put down? Have you defined it? Is it visible? That would be the first one where we say strategy. Second one is structure. Are there structures in your organization that help employees to express freely what they feel, understand each other, and also ask for feedback because one of the most important things of uh, emotional intelligence, implementing emotional intelligence is for one to be self-aware and aware of one's team members. So do you have structures in place which, um, of, uh, which give a safe environment, not the ones where you say, if you give a feedback about your manager, hmm, you're going to be you know, taken to task in your next appraisal. Not, not such ones, but do you have very, very safe environments put, to, put in place that um, uh, give employees freedom to express and know each other and reduce the blind spot? And finally, are there reward and recognition mechanisms there for role models to be highlighted and recognized when they demonstrate such behavior? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Surya, Anne, and Rajiv. I think we got the best panelists for this session. Uh, it was great to listen to all of your insights, and I'm sure our audience found it very useful. Um, and thank you for truly making this a remarkable hour of learning. I'd also like to thank our partner, Northscape, for uh, sharing this invaluable uh, information with us and helping us curate this session. Uh, I think it's made us uh, all go back with actionable insights. So thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure hosting you. Do share your feedback with us uh, on the chat section. Uh, there will be a link to the survey. And do stay tuned for more such exciting sessions. Thank you and have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Thank, thank you, Surya. You. Thank Bye, you, Anne. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Anne. Great Bye. talking. Thank you. Thanks.